Good morning, everyone. We are going to start here in about a minute. We're just gonna let people finish getting logged in here and we'll get going. All right. Welcome, everyone. We are really excited to be bringing you this webinar today. Um, I'm very excited about who we're going to bring on to talk with all of you. Um, this is going to be a very much more of a, a research focused webinar about workforce and community needs. A couple housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so we will send out the links to this afterwards. Um, it'll be available on Monday and then it'll also be available on the website. So um, you'll be able to get that as soon as we're done. And um, we will have question and answer period at the end. If you have any questions, there is a question box that you can type into and we'll receive those at the end and go through all of those at the end as well. Um, there is also an option to be able to chat. Um, with the attendees so you can chat your questions as well um, and if we have an answer to a question that we're not that's more independent wise you are able to also um, receive that from the panelists as well so with that after all the housekeeping my name is Kirsten McPherson I'm the director of marketing for Golden Shovel Agency um, I'm just kind of here to help facilitate and do the question and answer period. And then um, we are with us, we have Ben, who will give his self his introduction in a few minutes. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I hope you guys all enjoy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Winchester. I'm a research fellow with University Extension. Um, thank you, Kirsty, and thanks to the folks at Golden Shovel for uh, hosting this webinar today. Uh, you'll, you'll see that the title of my presentation is Rewriting the Rural Narrative. And uh, my premise here today, I, I'm a rural sociologist. I, I've been studying rural areas for roughly 20 years. And I, I've been doing research around this theme of uh, what I call rewriting the rural narrative. Um, I, I don't know to what extent all of you are living or working in rural communities, but um, I, the premise here is that the rural narrative is so negative. I think many people think they could never actually live in a rural place unless they were a farmer, right? Um, when today the, the economy, social life, everything is so much more diverse, not just in rural areas, but in this country. So um, my premise here again is that the narrative we use to describe our rural communities is straight out of the 50s and 60s. Uh, and we really don't have a good idea of some of these uh, actually very positive trends that are happening uh, in our rural communities. And you'll see the subtitle here is Speak Softly and Carry Statistics. Uh, I'm a data geek. Uh, most of the uh, information I present here today is based on you know books or articles or some research uh, methods. So if you've got um, any uh, questions or critiques about the methods, I, I encourage you to reach out to me. So uh, let's see here. We will move on. So my background, uh, initially my undergraduate was in statistics and I, I started to do research uh, for some of these rural development organizations across the country in the 90s. And it was during that time that, you know, I'm starting to read books, uh, starting to read journal articles. And if you look at kind of the narrative that's being used, I, you know, I was trained here in Minnesota, and this, uh, this presentation is going to be Minnesota-centric to, to an extent, uh, but I can guarantee everything is apl applicable nationwide. Uh, I've been doing work all across the Midwest, uh, out west, out east, southeast part of the country. All of these trends that you'll see here today hold true. So again, kind of going back to when I started, um, I, I was the first employee at an organization called the Center for Small Towns. And this was based in Morris, Minnesota on the prairie. And it was there again, I started reading all these books. And if you kind of look at the books and the headlines uh, that we use to describe whoop, our rural communities, that it, it's wholly negative, like right, decline of rural Minnesota, fighting for the countryside, survival of rural America. And one I'd like to talk just a second about is hollowing out the middle. 
And that's this book. Um, uh, it's called The Rural Brain Drain and What It Means for America. And many of you probably know the brain drain is when your um, young people in your town, uh, when they graduate from school, they go off and they, you know, explore the world. They go to college, they go into the military, they go find a job in the metro. They do a lot of different things. But somehow this is equated with a huge problem for our towns because apparently when we lose our 18 year olds, our town takes a right turn into the ditch. Um, and so really when you use language like this, like our towns are being hollowed out because we're losing our 18 year olds. Um, I wanna challenge that pretty significantly here today uh, using some of the research we've done on the University of Minnesota. So meanwhile, the kind of backdrop between, behind everything uh, that we study in rural communities is not really all that positive. It's pretty negative. And uh, so I want to introduce a term to you called anecdata. Anecdata is information which is presented as if it's based on serious research, but in fact it's based on what somebody thinks is true. And I can't tell you how many times people just throw uh, an anecdote out and they, they proclaim that this is true across the community, that you know this town um, used to have much, uh, much better jobs, or we used to have a better family life, or whatever it is. You know, we kind of go back to the, these days which may or may not have ever existed before. So uh, as a statistician, I, I'll tell you that uh, the plural of anecdote is not data. You get one or two people with very loud voices talking about how this town used to be great, and now we, now we really have nothing left here, and you know, we've lost all our young people, our business is closed, like, Yep, we're going to talk about some of these things, but, it, but is the town in worse shape today than ever before? We'll look at some of this. So I'll, I'll go back and we will talk about some of these significant changes that have impacted our rural communities. In the early 1900s, the mechanization of agriculture alone reduced the number of farm workers uh, by 40 to 80 percent. So again, we used to have um, large farm families and you would need all those kids essentially to work the land. When the 1910s, 1920s, uh, we mechanized that whole industry. Uh, so ultimately, we had a large outmigration of our youth from our rural communities to those urban centers because there really just weren't a lot of jobs. Now, uh, as we start to move forward, like again, uh, I, here's a picture of Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, and I think this is the kind of nostalgic view that people have of what a small town should look like, right? A full main street, you know, you've got four grocery stores or three gas stations, apothecaries, hardware stores, I mean, you name it. This is the idyllic notion of what a small town should be. But, uh, you know, as roads and transportation systems started to, started to gain strength, and I'm talking about 1910, 1920 here. I'm not talking about like I-90, I-80, I-70, like those weren't even put in until the 60s. We're talking about the very first time that roads connected one town to another. And this is literally just 100 years ago. So, I mean, some people might say that was a long time ago, but really when we look at the kind of structure of society, this wasn't that long ago that we went from Little House on the Prairie, where, you know, essentially it would take you a day to get to, you know, from Walnut Grove to Mankato for that doctor's appointment. It would take you a day to get there. Um, then you'd be there for two days and a day to get back. You went from horse and buggy to not horse and buggy in the matter of 10 years. And this, this uh, really affected our small town significantly in, in both good and bad ways, because now you could get to Mankato and back in one day. You were able to uh, find maybe better shopping rates uh, than the ones you had in your town. And because of some of these you know, uh, agglomeration uh, effects that we're starting to see, the rise of regional centers. And you know them today. We've got regional centers all across the country. Uh, but ultimately, when some towns gained, other, other towns lost. And essentially, some of our towns then um, were challenged on their main street. They would start to close this store and this store closed, right? And even as we started to head in the 50s and 60s, um, I, I use the term main street restructuring here and it's a really kind way of saying a lot of businesses closed. And we still have some of those closing today, but not to the extent we did. Uh, so essentially we did start to see, you know, we can't have four gas stations in town, three of them closed or hardware stores closed, apothecaries closed, grocery stores closed. And uh, in many ways, you can look at the headlines in our small town newspapers and they would say, you know, if we close our hardware store, our small town's gonna die. If we close our grocery store, our small town's gonna die. And the same for uh, school consolidations too. You know, in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, a lot of rural school districts consolidated. 
And again, it was like, boy, if it wasn't for open enrollment, our school would still be open. Or if it wasn't for private schools, right? There's a lot, a lot of ration, rationalization that takes place when essentially that rationalization is not true. Same with Main Street restructuring, like, if, oh, we should have shopped here more, right? Well, I want to remind you that every time you hear of a hardware store closing in a small town, one closed in the metropolitan area too. So every time you hear one closing in Hancock, Minnesota, a town of 700 people, I lived there for 12 years. Uh, yeah, we did lose our grocery store while I lived there. Um, but there's also one that closed in Minneapolis too. There's a hardware store that closed in a small town, but there's another one that closed in the metro. It is not a distinctly rural trait that causes you know, these restructurings to take place. These restructurings are occurring because of globalization. So again, uh, in many ways, our small towns are microcosms of the change that our world is going through. When we start to witness some of these structural changes, uh, we, we think that you know it's just another nail in the coffin. We lose our grocery store. In school consolidations too, a lot of blame goes around, but essentially the top reason why our schools consolidated is not because we chose all of these bad, made all these bad choices, quote unquote. It's because of birth rate. When your kindergarten class went from 100 kids to 50 kids over 12 years, something's got to give, and that did give. Um, so essentially, you want to do something about school consolidation, um, you know, start having pro-fertility days in your small towns and start encouraging more, kid, more people to have kids in our small towns. But, you know, we're not, we're not really going back to those kinds of characteristics here. So um, I like the Mark Twain quote. Uh, so essentially kind of going back to, you know, all of those major changes, you know, stores closing, hardware stores, grocery stores, our schools, right? All of them seem like another nail in the coffin of our small town. And we know this, rural is dying. That is the headline about rural and has been for decades. Uh, but I, I just want to remind you that I like the Mark Twain quote here, rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Um, rural areas aren't dying, they're changing. They're changing just like everyone else. So let's look at some of this, this data here. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I, I just want to step back one for one more kind of piece of this narrative and how this narrative gets driven nationally and even locally. Um, I did a study for uh, the McKnight Foundation here in Minnesota to look at how the metropolitan media portrayed rural Minnesota in general. And what we found is that obviously, and you probably well know this, that it, it, you know, a lot of the stories covered things like plant closures or murders or tornadoes and really, I mean, not positive things that happened in our small towns. But you know, as we uh, did the studies, one of the things I like to do is I asked reporters, like, what time of day did you go to DeGraff, Minnesota? Or what time of day did you go to Hancock, right? And the average time of day the metropolitan media got out of the metropolitan area and to our small towns was between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Well, who are you going to find in your small towns between 10 and 2? Especially when we have had a major shift to working in regional centers as opposed to every small town. You're not going to find many folks. So meanwhile, the reporter goes up and down Main Street, and what do they see but a boarded up building where the apothecary used to be. Uh, they might see a boarded up school, right? And, and it just reaffirms in his mind that this idyllic notion of rural is dead, and that there is nothing left. So what does the reporter do? You go to the cafe, and who do you find in the cafe? The retired farmers, who talk about how life used to be, and we used to have this, and we used to have that, and we could have had, and we should have had. And like this becomes part of the narrative of that town. Because there are a lot of voices that remember where the town used to be. The town doesn't look the same as it used to, and you tend to think that when it looks different, it looks worse. So ultimately, there's a lot of challenges here fighting against this narrative. And sometimes we use this own narrative. We living in these small towns think that I live in the middle of nowhere, right? I mean, there's, we, have, we have all these kind of negative things in our back pocket, but we also have our rationale, right? Like we could have had 3M in our, in our town if the zoning board. Or 40 years ago would have just rezoned that land north of town, right? I mean, none of it's true. I mean, there may be a, sub, a couple occasions where that's true. But ultimately, we've got this narrative of rationalization, which ultimately is negative and doesn't do us any good when we talk about our small towns today. Because ultimately, why would anybody want to move to your town if all you talk about is where you've been and all you talk about is how bad it is here today relative to where you used to have it? So, Here's some data. The rural population since 1970 hasn't gone down, it's gone up. It's gone up by 11%. Uh, what's gone down is the relative percentage of Americans living in a rural place. 
So in 1970, one in four people lived in a rural place. But by 2010, that went down to one in five. And how can that be, right? I thought the rural population went up. The rural population went up by 11%, but the urban population went up by 50%. So we've had overall population growth, but it hasn't been as fast as in the metro, so it results in a relative percentage decline. This is almost the headline every time we see, though, is that people prefer to live in urban environments. That's not true. What's true is that the urban population is growing faster, but that doesn't mean more people prefer to live in a rural place. And there are actually constraints on rural growth that we'll talk about. So I wanna talk about one data point here that's called total, and, total population infatuation. Everybody loves their total population numbers because it, because it becomes some measure of success, right? Um, so here's Minnesota again, you know, the counties in the Southwestern and the border counties, the North and South Dakota have experienced population loss in the 90s and the 2000s. And right, you know, when the new sign comes out after the census, it's like if your population went up, you're a big winner. And if it goes down, you're a big loser. Well, apparently, um, there is some nuance here. I, I want to explain to you why total population, I want to really encourage you to never use it as an indicator for success because it, it clouds over all of the actual change that occurs in our rural communities. So I want to talk about one region in, in Minnesota here. It's a five-county region uh, in western Minnesota. It's on the prairie. And if you use total population, their total population went from 69,000 in 1960 to 45,000 in 2010, a loss of 35% of the people. But the number of households in the region went up by 3%. Well, what exactly is going on here? Let's talk about some of this. So how can you end up with a lower population but the households go up? Well, it used to be that we would have two kids in our household, but now we've got one. And actually, it would be more accurate to say in the 60s, people had four kids, but people today have two. So what may have in the past that one household would have held six, or six people, now is holding four people, or it used to be four people, and now it's three people. So now um, there's also changes So in our household. So what may in one time period, it may have been a two-child uh, two household, but what happens when the two kids graduate? They move out. Your population goes down by two, but the number of households stays the same. Can you hear me there? Somebody type it in the chat quick. I seem to have lost my marker. Okay, you can hear me. I'm not sure what happened to our PowerPoint here. So um, I'm gonna, sorry guys, we're gonna try to figure this out here. So essentially we end up with these situations where the households look different. Um, so everybody, you cannot see the PowerPoint anymore, right? For some reason I've lost, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my PowerPoint and get back on um, one second here. Just a screen with Ben, right? Okay, that's what I see too. <laughs> Let me share my PowerPoint window and I'm just gonna keep going through this. Um, Okay, I don't know what you can see. Oh shoot, now I can't see this window either. Hold on one second. Okay, do you see my, uh, it is back now. Is that uh, my PowerPoint here that you see? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna get back to my spot here. Okay, so hopefully this looks okay for everyone. Um, so essentially, again, we go from uh, what happens to this household is that you may have had, again, two kids graduate. And then, uh, so what happens in one time period is you counted four people, but in this time period, we're counting two, right? So what happens? Your population went down by two, but the number of households, there's no change. But showing double, yeah. Um, let me try to swap these. There, how about that? Does that look better? And so now we end up with a situation where um, the, the population goes down by two, but the households show no change. Now, if we go to the next slide, again, what happens if you have a senior household 
and one of the seniors passes away, but the remaining spouse stays there. So essentially what happens now to your population, it goes down by one, but the number of households stays the same. Or sometimes, and we see this more frequently right now with seniors, is that we may have a single surviving spouse pass away and ultimately the kids are holding on to the house for some reason. And we'll see this uh, in some of the data. Um, and, and this becomes problematic. So in all of these circumstances, the population has went down, but the number of households has stayed the same. I hope this makes sense because this is vital to understanding the changes that we've seen in our communities, because it's less about people all moving away from our rural communities and more about the structure of our households looks different. And because that structure, oops, because that structure is smaller, it looks like our population continues to go down. So uh, one of the first data points I ran into was about uh, migration and that for Minnesota, and this was true about 48% across the nation, but roughly 46% of Minnesota residents move every five years. And this kind of blew me away. Um, and this kind of goes against the myth that only the lucky few escape, right? The idea is that you need to get out of your small town to somehow be successful, right? Um, but essentially, we don't have a good idea, I would argue, as to who's moving in and who's moving out. We talk about the kids moving out, but we've done research here in Minnesota that shows, uh, not just in Minnesota, but across the country, there are people in their 30s, 40s, and sometimes their 50s that are moving in to our rural communities. This isn't new. This has been happening since the 70s, and we're going to call this the rural brain game. So we interviewed... Uh, of thousands of newcomers to small towns. Newcomers are people that moved in the past five years. And we asked them like, why did you move to this rural community? And the top three reasons people gave were number one, simpler pace of life. Number two, safety and security. And number three was a low cost of housing. A job was not in the top 10 in Minnesota. And now this becomes problematic and an opportunity for economic development because you know our traditional approach is jobs first, that jobs, jobs, jobs. But ultimately, if you have a jobs first approach, it turns into what I call the warm body syndrome. Now we don't care who we get, we just want to get somebody to fill this job. Well, you know what, we don't live in an economy, we live in a community. So we need to ensure that these future workers are also gonna be happy residents. And this is where we start to expand now all right, if people are looking at all of these non-job reasons for uh, moving to this community, then maybe we should be doing more related to non-job community development for our new employees and potential employees, more importantly. So essentially, we call this the brain gain, right? It's all the negative narrative when you talk about brain drain, but really, these newcomers are coming in with job skills and education, a career, networks, family, love for their community, a passion for uh, the town that they're moving to. Uh, and this becomes a huge opportunity for our rural communities. But many times we don't even see these newcomers. We don't, and I can't even, I, I just want to step back. We, we don't even see these folks. Like I'm in Minnesota. Right now it's dark when we get up in the morning and dark when we get home. And we wouldn't even know if there were new people that moved in down the street until the spring. Right? We don't have welcome wagons in town like we used to because the post office can't just hand out a list of all the new people. Like It, it is so difficult to see. But you could be pumping gas next to your neighbor and you wouldn't even know it. So I, I think we've got a huge missed opportunity here. Um, but this now becomes an opportunity for community and economic developers alike as we move forward. So another idea here that I want to fight against is the uh, narrative about the rural economy. And that's, you know, there's no jobs in rural areas. That's not true. Or that, you know, I think the headline here is that I, I can't be a blank in rural Minnesota or rural Kansas or rural Iowa. And what we had found, we did this study in Minnesota that showed whenever, you know, any one small rural community is not going to have a very diverse industrial base. It's not going to have a very diverse occupational base. But what we found is when you start bringing in three to five counties, i.e. the look of a metro area, then we have the very same diversity in the economy that the metropolitan areas do. We have the same composition of jobs across different industries. Of course, we have a few higher jobs in agriculture, but even within ag, like 70% of GDP in food production happens in the metro. Um, so there's this kind of interchange of, of, of economic reasoning here. So 
I want to hit on a few points. Number one, agriculture and ag-related jobs today make up less than 5% of the rural economy. Education and health services are by far the largest industries we've got in rural America. They make up roughly a third of all of our jobs. So the point here after this slide is to say that you can be a blank in a rural community. It might not be every rural community and you may need to look around, but ultimately you can be an electrical engineer in rural Minnesota. You can be a book editor. You can be a blank, like fill in the blank with just about any job and you can find it. These newcomers are also creating community groups. I think there's an idea here that social life is dead, but when we look at this map, and this holds true across the country, um, I use the number of nonprofits as an indicator for social diversity. And what we find is that social life is certainly not dying out. We have some counties where the number of nonprofits goes down, but even here, it's like out with the old, i.e. the Eagles clubs are closing, but, and in with the new. Like, hey, we've got a West Central Minnesota Snowmobile Association. There's a really great diversity here. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but um, there's a very strong idea here that social life is <laughs> really not dying. In fact, it's been flourishing across our rural places. What has shifted is how people wanna be involved. They wanna be involved less in place-based groups with a broad focus and more in a wide geography with a narrow focus. So we would shift from the Hancock Community Betterment Club which only served Hancock, it's a narrow geography, but it had a broad focus. They would help like build the school or put up a senior center, whatever it was. Where today want to be, people want to be involved in just the opposite. Rather than a narrow geography, it's a broad geography, or rather than a broad focus, like helping anything in town, it's a narrow focus. Again, the West Central Minnesota Snowmobile Association or Bicycling Association, right? So these are, these are challenges for us too because a lot of times when I share information and research about these new people moving into town, um, they, uh, the, new, the existing residents are like, well, if there's all these new people in town, where are they? They're not part of my groups. And I would say, yeah, they're not part of your groups. They're part of theirs. Um, so I think uh, there's another notion here I want to hit on, which is that you know everybody in your small towns. You don't. You don't know a third of the people in our small towns. We got half our population moving every five years. Like, how do you keep tabs on people? You may know of some people, but you don't truly know them. Now, as economic developers too, when we started to do this brain gain research, we found people that were self-employed, they were 1099 workers, they're working for Wells Fargo from outstate you know, rural Iowa. I mean, there are people living everywhere, but they may not be walking into your economic development office because essentially they don't need you in a sense, but, they, but also do you even see them as economic developers? So this is, becomes part and parcel of where we're going for future economic development. Um, now, getting back to the narrative here uh, about how wholly negative it is, but here's uh, the Pew Research Institute did a study a number of years ago that asked people like, yeah, we know that 20% of you live in small towns and rural places, but if you could live anywhere in the country, where would you like to live? 51% of Americans said they would prefer to live in a small town or a rural place, but just 20% do. There's like a huge market opportunity here, but why? Don't more people live there? I argue a large part of this is because of the narrative. Like it, the narrative about rural is so negative, people think I could never be a blank. I could never live in rural Minnesota. I'm not a farmer. Like, man, we need to expand the definition of what it means to live rural in this country. So now um, there is a national societal preference to live in small towns and rural places. People are moving to small towns and have been for a long time. Uh, I mean, we're almost in 2020 here. This is 50 years ago when this trend of people moving rural started. In many cases, and you may know this, our rural communities, we just don't have any housing. There is one sticking point, and that is in the 90s, this brain gain trend filled up just about every viable rural home in this country to the point that the only homes that are left are in rough shape. And then many times, people, when they're looking to move to a rural place, they can't find any homes for sale because some of those homes never go on the market. Because, you know, when you know people in town, you're like, John's house is finally for sale. Like, we're going to buy that, right? And it never hits the market. So essentially, we've got a very tight housing market right now. So we've got a tight labor market. We've got a tight housing market. This has some major impacts in how we do this work. So meanwhile, as we talk about this, um, this kind of 
we call it people attraction strategies. And it's a, it, it's a mix between housing, economic development, and community development, because ultimately you see now very brief, albeit a very brief review of this research, that if the top reasons that people choose a town are not because of the job, how do we work through this, right? So at, be, we're, we're gonna be, we are already in the tightest labor market we've ever known in this country. So now uh, employees are gonna have a considerable amount of power. And they're gonna say, I can move up here, I can move right here, and I can move right here. What's gonna be the difference between those three locations? And if all we do on the employee recruitment side is like do a tour of the shop floor, and you're like, here's the shop, and here's the tools we use, and here's the people you work with, right? Well, that doesn't tell you anything about where people are actually gonna live. Now, this becomes the opportunity to mix community and economic development. Ottertail County in uh, Western Minnesota, they hired a rural rebound coordinator. And it's his job to work with employers and work with housing agencies and work with communities to do more activities around welcoming. He will literally take potential employees out fishing. Uh, I mean, we need, to, we need to allow people, potential workers, to envision what their life is going to be like. And if you never leave your building when you're doing employee recruitment, you're doing a disservice, not just to your business now, but to your community. So meanwhile, here in Minnesota, we've had a lot of what I call resident recruitment initiatives sprout up across the country. Now, right now, we are going to be... Um, in the University Extension here, we are sending out 20,000 surveys to all the people who moved into rural Minnesota across roughly this area here. Um, so we are, we are going to be finding out more information about these movement and migration of people into our rural communities. So getting back to the narrative, we got this really negative narrative, and we may even use it. When you tell people when, you know, somebody new, new moves to town and you're like, why would you move here? What kind of language is that? The number one audience for your negative narrative are your kids. These are my kids. They know what narrative means. Is it positive or negative? Are we talking positively about a place or not? So I want to remind you that when, when we did all these interviews and focus groups uh, of folks that moved new to our small towns, when we asked people like, why did you move to your town? We never heard people say they moved to your town for pity. And what I mean is, why do we continue to hold on to this narrative of the past when essentially these new people moving in, they don't care. They literally don't care that you lost your grocery store 25 years ago. They don't care that you used to have a large manufacturer or a timber industry 40 years ago, right? So if you are not talking positively about what you have today, you're not going to be really speaking their language. And so hopefully, I mean, I have briefly went over some of the research we've got that shows very positive trends, but this means that you don't need to be seen as just some Pollyannish person living in a small town, that essentially there are good reasons to live here, right? We live in the middle of everywhere, not the middle of nowhere. So um, we need to find a way to be a bridge to the, be, to the people and the community. There's a labor shortage, tight labor markets. What does this mean? Economic development needs to incorporate housing and community development to be successful. Economic development strategies to inc incorporate people recruitment. Um, uh, we, and now we are hitting this housing shortage, limits migration. Right now, 30% of the homes in our rural communities uh, are owner-occupied households, and they're over the age of 75. 30% of our homes are occupied by seniors that are not gonna be living there for much long. So in many ways, I, whenever I hear that there's a workforce housing shortage, I say there's not a workforce housing shortage, you have plenty of workforce housing. It's currently occupied. So there is another presentation I do and research I do around housing, and that essentially we live in, and we have a policy of uh, living in the world of best intentions when it comes to our housing stock. When uh, we kind of you know, leave all the housing stock decisions up to the private individual. But, but I, I just wanna say that housing stock in your community is a community asset as much as it's an individual asset because people come and go out of those homes. So are you ready to welcome in the new wave of people? Again, 30% of your homes are gonna turn over in the next 10 years. Are you ready for it? 
Another 45% are baby boomers. A full 75% of your homes are going to turn over in the next 20, 25 years. And are you ready for it? How welcoming is your community? So now that I've said this, you can't say you don't see this coming. All right. So really, and again, get beyond total population and number of jobs as measure of success. Because ultimately, um, if our homes continue to be occupied by baby boomers, they're going to continue to retire. So, you know, there, there's a limit on the number of homes in our community. So essentially, when these baby boomers stop working, our employment numbers are going to go down. But that's just limited by our housing. It's not because fewer people um, actually want to work in that community. So uh, kind of stepping back here, there's a choice that people are making. People People are choosing to live in our rural communities and these newcomers are creating groups they're building their community they're diversifying the economy they're buying and starting businesses some are working from home they're living in this huge region and what I mean by this is um, I call it living in the middle of everywhere that most of the time all of our planning you know not all of our ED agencies they're either county or city based but the reality of rural life is you don't live and work and shop and play in just one town we live in a huge region that extends up to one to two hours out. Um, uh, like I lived in Hancock and I didn't want to eat at Buddy's Bar and Grill every time we ate out. We ate out at a dozen different towns in an hour radius around that small town. So uh, essentially thinking about what does that mean when most of our planning gets done in, at a you know, city jurisdictional level, but that's not how people live their lives. So now if you cannot help people realize what their life would look like in that regional perspective, you know, and get outside of your town, you really will be living in the middle of nowhere if you can't express uh, some of the assets in the region. And really, people are more than warm bodies. So the bottom line is people want to live and move to your towns for what you are today and will be tomorrow, not what may have been. So I just want to, you know, recommend you to talk positively about your towns. If you want some of the data, um, around housing or nonprofits or uh, uh, just uh, any of these data points you've seen here today, shoot me an email. Because um, uh, ultimately, you guys, uh, you've got the power to change the narrative in your communities. And, to, and really, more importantly, are you short-circuiting that negative narrative? Because if you're not, that negative narrative is pervasive. It is so embedded in the language we have when we describe not just what's happening at a national level, but at a local level. And we are some of our own worst enemies sometimes. <laughs> like, but essentially, like, you know, where's the future of our town going to be? The future of our town is built by the people here and some of the people that aren't even in our town yet. So are we preparing our communities for the future? So um, here's my email here uh, at benw at umn.edu. If you've got any questions, I really feel free to email me. Um, and, and I'm going to stop this share now, and we're going to try to get this back. I'm not really sure how to do this. You can keep up with yours if you want. I can bring it back on as well. Yeah, why don't you bring yours back on? I think I've relegated. So it just really, again, thank you all for the uh, time and attention here today. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Perfect. Okay, I'm not really sure. All right. Yeah, give me just a second. It's uh. We had some fun issues there, and now I can't figure out how to get it back. So, okay. Well, with that, just a reminder to everybody that we will be having a um, a recording of this. It'll be sent out to you, and we will kind of go through all of this different stuff. If you have any questions at this point, now's the time to ask. Um, and then let me pull up the emails real quick. Oops. Ben, do you just want to tell everybody your email really quick? We have one. Oh, never mind. Ben already has oh, yeah, it. Yeah, I just typed it in there. Yeah, I'll put it in chat here too, the regular chat. Perfect. Oops. Perfect. I didn't do it to everybody. Hold on. I gotta do it again. All right. And then is there any other questions from anybody? I'm interested to the extent to which you hear this narrative piece. Uh, I mean, do you, I, I don't know really how many of you are actually working in small towns um, and, or in rural communities, but really it is, this narrative is pervasive and I hope that I've given you some 
you know, quote unquote ammunition. My, you know, my last name is Winchester. So hopefully I give you some ammunition to fight off this negative narrative. Yeah, you know, one of the most surprising things to me, Ben, was, so I live in a very rural community in Northwest Colorado, very historically um, agriculture-based, huge energy-based. We have three coal mines and a coal-fired power plant. Um, and when you were kind of talking about when people are moving into the area, um, just the, the voices and the opinions of everyone who's already there as far as like, oh, why would you live here? We've had realtors who have told like new leadership moving in to not buy a house in the community. <laughs> so how do you work with people like in those segmented groups? Cause you know, the first people that you usually meet when you're moving to an area are realtors, um, maybe school districts, teachers, that type of thing. Are there certain points or tips that you can recommend on just even starting small in that regard on how to kind of retrain how they talk about the town? Yeah, right. Uh, you know, real estate agents are top of mind for us. They tend to be um, one of the first points of contact, and they also hear like warts and all about your town, right? Um, but really, we use real estate agents to help gauge um, where we're at. Like, what are people looking for in terms of housing or community amenities, and is that even on our list? But ultimately, um, we we see uh, other pieces. Like, think about tourism too. So, if you were to have a training, quote unquote, training in your town about the narrative of your community and about where you've been. I think it becomes important for us to uh, look at also frontline places like gas stations. You know, um, one of the things I like to do is when I visit a town is go in the gas station and you ask like, hey, um, do you, uh, what's, what's, some, what's something fun to do around here? And you know, the number one answer is nothing <laughs> right like oh there's nothing to do around here like man and a lot of times we hire high school kids right but um there's an exercise you can do called living in the middle of everywhere is what i do and it, it is you start gathering data you need to gather information about what are some of the things that people love to do in your community and then you ultimately use this as a template for training that you know when somebody comes in and, and practices like asking questions about you know uh What's it like to work here? What if I wanted to start a business? Like, do people have answers for this? Um, but essentially, we do other things too. Like, we have newcomer suppers. And these suppers are only for newcomers. And then we would have the high school students video record a brief interview with these newcomers. And you ask the newcomers, like, why did you move here? What do you love about this town? Because in many ways, the new people in your town have the best narrative of your community because nobody again moves to your town because they hate it like they're moving there for all these great reasons like oh my gosh we love that the park is only that you know state park is only 45 minutes away and there's just so such a vibrance here with regards to blank and blank like they will give you this language you just need to ask them and before you can ask them you need to find them so like how do you find the newcomers like you can literally purchase databases from uh, Lexus Nexus and Info USA that gives you the list of all the people that just moved in the past five years uh, would be one. Um, so really, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of opportunities. There is a program called Marketing Hometown America. We've adapted it. Uh, this was initially based upon my research on the newcomers uh, and is now in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Can uh, Kansas, maybe, um, and Nebraska. And essentially, it's a community development activity um, that has economic development outcomes. So really, we're just trying to um, think of different ways to improve the language. But if nobody ever challenges anyone, people are going to continue to use that negative narrative. So I think the question is, what can economic developers do to combat the negative narrative? Like every time somebody says something negative, ask them, like, are they ready to tell every new employee what they just said? Like talk about, you want to, you know, I quit, I mean, you have to, the mark of a good leader is making strong statements. And if you publicly challenge some of these narratives, like, yeah, this is going to be a problem point. Like I can't, Bob, I can't continue to have you talking about how terrible this town is because we want new people to move here. And sometimes I will say that, um, are you ready to never sell your house? Like for the people that have negative narratives, like, right, if they plan to retire and move away or go to the lake house or whatever, like, are you ready to not get a return on your home because you, you for whatever reason, don't like this place anymore? Um, 
it, it's a lot of work. Uh, you tend to hear that negative narrative, but it's just a shift in your dis in talking. But hopefully, um, again, some of the information I presented here, this brain gain trend has been going on for 50 years. So when you start bringing up serious research, this counters that negative narrative. And if you want data on the presence of nonprofits or other things, let me know. Um, so let's see, I'm just gonna go through the comments here. Uh, do you know of a rural community? Again, like there's lots of rural communities. Like Otter Tail County is a really great one. They just received an Excellence in Marketing Award from the Economic Development Association uh, Conference here in Minnesota. Um, just there's a lot of those different groups. You'll see it in the PowerPoint. You can Google some of those. Um, but every one of those kind of regional recruitment initiatives takes a different path. They've all got different strategies. And my point is, we don't have a well-worn strategy um, for you know, dealing with this. We need to try a lot of different things out. So um, let's see, can you expand on the observation that three to five counties banding together and can have a type of same diversity as Metro? How are, uh, yeah, sorry Warren, people are not working together very well. Um, I, I wanna remind everybody that our county boundaries were drawn during the time of horse and buggy. And somehow they are still relevant today and uh, lead to many more difficulties than I would argue we need. Uh, we see some regional work around the you know, mental health, uh, but every time we talk about like a regional jail, it seems like everybody wants a jail, nobody wants to be the partner, right? Um, so I think it becomes uh, an egotistic uh, piece of our work that we always want to be the one doing something. We want to be the center uh, when uh, we just don't have good examples of ways for our counties to work together. But these regional recruitment efforts really are regional. They're run a lot, a lot of times through our initiative foundations, our regional development commissions. Um, another way to do this is to stimulate small grants. The Northwest Minnesota Foundation uh, actually has a brain gain grant program and they just awarded two grants here this year um, to help support communities in kind of doing this rural narrative piece. Um, so sorry, it seems like I'm scrambling through a lot of different ideas here for the sake of time. Uh, let's see here. How important are PK-12 schools in getting people to move to a rural area? Uh, yeah, it's on the list. Uh, it's always on the list, but in many cases, the people are choosing rural, the, the people with kids are choosing many of our rural communities because they believe the schools aren't gonna be so big that their kids that play sports will always be able to actually, you know, participate. Or sometimes the kids are like, man, I'm second string. I never get a chance in this school because there's five, you know, 500 kids in the school and they're all competing for the limited uh, kind of recreational activities. So in many ways, um, it wasn't any one school. Really, essentially, there were no data points around a single characteristic of a school. Like being rural was important enough for opportunity. So, um, yep, it's on the list for people that have kids, but just half of the newcomers have kids. And uh, just a third of the newcomers were from that community. So there's kind of all these nuances to the data, which I can surely expand upon at some future opportunity here. Um, if you want, I, I think there's, uh, let me see if I can find this link. Yeah, here we go. Um, so there's a sign up, I'm gonna put in the link here for a webinar series uh, that I do that will be offered this summer. I think that's it. You should go to a sign up piece here. Um, we're gonna have up to five webinars in this series to talk about uh, these traits in more depth. What you have seen today is an extremely abbreviated version of I think all of these pieces. Um, so if you wanna sign up there, um, feel free to do that. Uh, we'll be starting that, uh, getting that notice out here soon. So, uh, is the Marketing Hometown America report available online? Um, let me find, sorry, I'm Googling things here quick. Um, here's a link to our landing page for the Making It Home program if you wanna read more about this. So other questions here today. Yeah, any success stories of Minnesota counties have banded together? Not really. Um, <laughs> no, uh, no, I will say that when you look at that, uh, again, that one slide that has the brain gain initiatives, there is a Get Rural program out of Western Minnesota that's run through the RDC in Appleton, Minnesota. In North Central, there's um, 
oh boy, now I can't remember them all. It's on, there's that one slide here. I'll try to find this real quick and share this. Oops, no, not that one. Let me do this. I think that's being shared with you right now. Um, but we've got uh, the good life in region five run through the RDC. Live wide open is uh, through the West Central Initiative and that's a nine county area that they cover. And then we've got other smaller ones. Fairmont area is just at the county level. Min Bump is Big Stone County. Uh, the Get Roll program is the five county Western Minnesota. But uh, they all do. They all try different things. So there really isn't. Um, there really isn't a, a success story. There are multiple things that people are doing, but we're not. We're hesitant to say one is more successful than another because essentially there's just a lot of different things people are trying. So other questions are Kirsty, if you want to jump in here. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions coming up. Um, this was definitely very interesting for me. So I really appreciate you coming in here. Um, and we hope we're going to definitely bring you back again. This was great. Thank you so much. You um, I will leave it open for another couple seconds. I don't see any other questions. Um, again, just for everybody, you'll receive the recording for this webinar. Um, we'll make sure that we attach Ben's contact information as well. So you can get a hold of him and hopefully you can get a hold and sign up for the webinar that he posted about as well. But Ben, thank you so much. This is really interesting. You bet. Thank you. Have a nice day there, everyone.